Welcome to section 12.1. Now in section 12.1, we're gonna start focusing on DNA, what it's made of, how it functions. But before we get to that point, we weren't sure what the genetic material was at the very beginning of this. So when Mendel did his work, he didn't know what the genetic material was. He knew essentially how it worked, but not what molecule was responsible for it. Later on, we understood that chromosomes, because of meiosis, mirroring what Mendel talked about, law of segregation, independent assortment, so we knew chromosomes carried the genetic material, but chromosomes are about half and half DNA and protein. So there was this big debate on what is the genetic material, DNA or protein. Now the first person to experiment to kind of demonstrate that DNA is the genetic material was Griffith and Avery. Now Griffith was the guy that did this initially, so he kind of did the experiment. Avery was the one that kind of realized the significance of the experiment. He's the one that realized that this meant that DNA must be the culprit. Now how this worked, they infected some mice with a particular strain of a bacteria. This particular strain lacked something called a capsule, so basically just the surrounding piece, and so it was called the rough strain. This one did not kill the mouse, so the mouse was fine after it was injected. Now there's another strain of that same bacteria that has this outer capsule. Having that outer capsule makes it where it becomes lethal, so it would kill the mice. So down here you can see mouse did not make it. Now later he got this idea of what happens if I take this lethal version and I heat it up to kill it. So now the bacteria is dead. And he injected that in a mouse and saw it did not kill the mouse. So then he got this kind of cool idea of taking the remnants that had been heat killed, so this is the dangerous smooth strain that kills it, that had been heat killed, and he mixed those remnants in with the non-lethal rough strain. Now by doing this, he didn't kind of know what would happen, he was just kind of curious, but he found that it did become the smooth strain, it became lethal and killed the mouse. So this seemed to imply to him something that he called transformation, which is this idea that bacteria can grab genetic material from their environment and use it. So in this case, some of the rough bacteria that lacked that capsule that made them lethal were able to grab the genetic material that allowed them to then build that capsule to become the lethal version, the smooth strain, and kill the mouse. So this in itself was like a big discovery and awesome. But then Avery came along and said, wait a second. If you heat up proteins, they denature, they break down, they change shape, they no longer are what they were before. So if I heat kill the smooth strain, any genetic information that was stored as protein would have been destroyed. It wouldn't have been there for the rough strain, right, the ones when they mixed them together. The rough strain bacteria couldn't have grabbed the genetic material that coded for being smooth because it wouldn't have been there. The heat would have destroyed it. DNA, however, is much more resistant to temperature. And so at that point, if you heat killed it, there still could have been DNA around, if it's the genetic material, that would have the proper coding information that says, all right, let's build a capsule. So Avery was able to deduce that DNA must be the genetic material because only DNA would be able to withstand the heat that was applied that killed these smooth strain bacteria. So therefore, DNA must be the genetic material. Now, people didn't believe them automatically just because they came up with this. This was kind of like strike one, but a lot of people still wanted more evidence because proteins seem to be more diverse. Proteins seem to be a better target to be our genetic material. So we move on to round two, where scientists Hershey and Chase came through and said, all right, we also know that viruses contain protein and DNA. That's pretty much it. And so they said, what if we radioactively tag the proteins by using radioactive sulfur? Because sulfur is found only in the proteins. They then said, well, phosphorus is only found in the DNA. So we can also, in a separate group of viruses, radioactively tag only the phosphorus. So they essentially had these viruses be built with radioactive phosphorus and had a separate group of viruses be built with radioactive sulfur. So they could now track the proteins from the virus and they could now track the DNA from the viruses. They then allowed these viruses to infect bacteria. They then centrifuged them, so they spun it really fast to make the bacteria sink to the bottom. So we had a pellet of bacteria, and then above it you just had all the fluid that there was prior that the bacteria was living in. And they were able to analyze where is the radioactive material. Is it down in the bottom with the bacteria, or is it in the top, meaning it did not go inside the bacteria. Now they knew viruses worked by reprogramming a cell. So that means that the genetic information had to enter the cell to reprogram it. 
So they figured that whatever's present in the bacteria must be the genetic material. So they ran the experiment, they infected a bunch of bacteria with the strain that had the radioactive protein. They infected in a separate scenario a bunch of bacteria that had been infected by viruses that had radioactive DNA. They then centrifuged them and they found that only the DNA was actually inside of the bacteria. The protein was not, it was in that liquid up top, it never entered the bacteria. So therefore, if the only thing that entered, and we know the genetic material in, like enters the bacteria, so if the only thing that actually entered the bacteria was DNA, DNA must be our genetic material. So it was really this one that kind of made us understand that, all right, we know it's between these two, but it now obviously must be DNA. So from here on forward, we now know DNA is the genetic material, but we didn't know much about DNA. We knew what it was made of, but we didn't know its structure. So now we go and we do another turn here where there's this race to figure out what DNA looks like, how it works, because we just didn't know much about DNA besides the fact that it's apparently really important and the genetic information for cells. So what we knew at that point about DNA is we knew that there were essentially these pieces, these nucleotides, that DNA had a phosphate group, it had a pentose sugar, and it had a nitrogen base. This is the ones that you might have seen before that were adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. So we knew all this. What we didn't understand is how all those things came together to build us this giant macromolecule. You know, we didn't know is there one strand, is there two strand, is there three strands? Do the strands connect by the phosphate groups, the sugars, or the nitrogen bases? Do they connect by multiples? We had no real functional understanding of how all this worked. It's kind of like me giving you a bunch of Lego pieces and saying, we know that these are the Lego pieces there. Now figure out what the shape of them is supposed to be. You know, you need to ultimately build Harry Potter's castle or whatever it is you're doing. But originally, all you see is a pile of these pieces it's not blatantly obvious what it's supposed to do or, or how you're supposed to arrange them.